Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, so much. We, we have a lot to cover, as, you, as you've seen, and we've gone through quite a bit. Let me, let me go back to a couple of issues that we've already started to address a little bit. One is on the drug interdiction issues. And what I want to do is to be able to walk through the drug interdiction and what we're seeing coming from Mexico versus coming from China. Uh, one is obviously coming by mail more, and sometimes Chinese are sending it to Mexico, then Mexico is actually bringing you north from there. Uh, so help us understand what you see as the difference between the amount of drugs coming into the United States from Mexico and the amount of drugs coming in uh, through China. Thank you, Senator. Uh, two, the, the two main vectors, frankly, for synthetics, uh, especially synthetic opioids, fentanyl, carfentanyl, and analogs. Uh, so we, in, in this massive flood of e-commerce, this tremendous growth of, of mail shipments coming from China, uh, express consignment uh, coming from China, we are seeing hard narcotics, uh, vials of fentanyl, 25 grams uh, that we're trying to detect in, in this flood of packages, uh, and it's very potent. Uh, the, the drug seizures we're making in the mail environment are, are 90 percent pure on average, uh, so a very small amount uh, could actually be pressed into pills uh, at a very high level in terms of, of making profit and, and producing doses in the U.S. Uh, on the Mexican side, we're seeing you know, prepackaged uh, fentanyl doses, often in, in pill presses, uh, that it's more at the 10 percent purity level. So it's a much lower level, uh, but it's produced ready to use as opposed to needing further processing in the U.S. Uh, I think the, the bulk uh, of our volume seizures are still on the southwest border uh, for all drugs, but, but including our, our synthetic opioids. We do see precursors coming from China and other countries being synthesized by cartels in Mexico and then smuggled across our border in increasing uh, amounts as well. Uh, they, they tend to seek to seize the market share on, on any new uh, opportunity uh, to, to uh, smuggle drugs into the U.S. So that, that's what we've seen in, in, with fentanyl as well. So what is the cooperation like? like right now with the Mexican government since the bulk of the drugs coming in the United States are coming across our southwest border? So we, we've established connections uh, with the new leaders uh, of, our, of our counterpart agencies from, from PGR that does the investigations uh, to the federal police, which is transitioning into a National Guard uh, status. Uh, right now, they just had a, a very uh, overwhelming vote in, in support of, of transitioning to a National Guard. That's going to be a, a five-year process. We, we know what it's like to, to merge and change as a department. We, we did that uh, in 2003 uh, extensively. That, that, that's a distraction. So, so that's something that we want to work with our partners to make sure we remain focused on the threats. Uh, we've got good relationships uh, with their head of security. Uh, 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 Secretary DeRazo, and we're going to stay focused on, on this issue and try to maintain uh, our efforts. We have seen uh, targeted takeouts of meth labs based on intelligence and information sharing from uh, U.S. law enforcement. So I think that's a positive sign. That is a positive sign. Tell, tell me about the um, effectiveness or not a non-effectiveness of new fencing. You've replaced some of the fencing uh, in right. San Diego and some of that area. You've had enough time to be able to evaluate it. How's it working compared to old fencing? Yeah, a complete difference. And I, I'm glad you asked that question because there's been a lot of uh, reporting that suggests this isn't a new capability. This is just replacement. This isn't helpful. Uh, this, this wasn't uh, important uh, border wall. It, it couldn't be further from the truth. Those were our top requirements. Uh, we, we had uh, this dilapidated wall. This was the first wall built because it was needed the most in San Diego and in El Centro sector, for instance. Now having a 30-foot wall in El Centro sector where there's a mall within 40 yards of the border has completely changed that dynamic. The traffic has dropped off the table in that area and we're able to deploy and use our agents more efficiently in other parts of the sector. So do you have a good idea of side by side what uh, the movement of individuals or drugs used to be through that same area or what it is now with the new fencing? We do. I can get you that data. The percentage Great. drop has been dramatic. That'd be great. So we'd like to be able to see that because obviously there has been a lot of pushback to say this is just replacement, so it makes no difference. Uh, the, the numbers that I've seen on a preliminary basis show a pretty significant difference uh, between that new fencing and between the older fencing that right. wasn't very effective at all. Uh, let, let me shift gears a little bit. My state has been like several states that so we have had a tremendous amount of water uh, come on us. Right. Uh, the flooding in my state has been pretty dramatic and continues to increase, and we have storms predicted the next four days in a row uh, again. 
Uh, so this is an area that I'm tracking very, very closely, working with the Corps of Engineers and with others that are there. FEMA's been on the ground. We appreciate FEMA's engagement there, and, and we'll continue to be able to work with you on that. What do, what do you need at this point that you do not have already uh, for disaster relief, whether that be in my state in Oklahoma, whether it be in Missouri, where there was a um, tornado last night in right. uh, Jefferson City, or whether that be in Florida or Puerto Rico or in California? So I, I think we have the resources and the support we need uh, to support Oklahoma uh, in this recovery. Uh, I talked to the governor la two weeks ago about the flooding and the potential for increased flooding as rains continue and the, and the river stays very high. Uh, we're, we're very worried about it. And what I heard was the partnership between the state and locals and FEMA has been tremendous on this, uh, that, that they, they're getting what they need at the state level. But I absolutely want to continue the communication. We'd love to hear from your office if there are opportunities to improve that. Thank you. We'll continue to, get, uh, to uh, walk through that. Uh, FEMA's cooperation has been excellent, and uh, w we appreciate that continued engagement there. Uh, I, I need to ask you just a couple other quick things. One is on the Coast Guard process. You and I have talked uh, briefly before that as far as interdiction on the water, uh, the Coast Guard process for interdictions and Customs and Border Patrol have two different structures uh, to do interdiction. The Coast Guard process is much longer than Customs and Border Patrol, uh, and I've always wondered within DHS, uh, while we have two entities both on the water, one has one process, one has another, and uh, the Coast Guard process is a much, much longer process. And I'd like for you just to be able to take a look again and to be able to help our Coast Guard folks able to do a faster interdiction as the Customs and Border Patrol does currently as well. There's also some non-lethal resources that Customs and Border Patrol have when they're on the water that Coast Guard does not have access to. And it'd be helpful to be able to help both those entities on the water to be able to get that level of uh, uh, engagement interdiction faster. Uh, let me shift a little bit to cybersecurity. Um, what DHS did in the 2018 election was pretty remarkable in your engagement in Lean In. Uh, a lot of threats, a lot of lessons learned from 2016, uh, very different uh, DHS engagement in 2018. Uh, I know you're staying engaged, but I need to ask you about that. How is the engagement for election security and knowing that every federal agency looks to you to be able to help them with cybersecurity for that entity. How is that going as far as resource-wise? Yeah, so this is something I've been working on uh, multiple times a week in, this, in my six weeks as acting, but it's also an area where I have high confidence in Chris Krebs and the leadership of our CISA team. Uh, I think they have a great strategy to, to capitalize on the successes and momentum from 18 for the 2020 election, Protect 2020, uh, we're calling it. They want to get to all 8,800 jurisdictions in the country, not just all 50 states, but, but all the jurisdictions that are overseeing elections and make sure that they have the right uh, systems in place that if they want uh, scanning or penetration testing, we can do that in advance and help them prepare. Uh, and, and really, I think the relationships and the communication is robust. We built a lot of trust uh, from 16 to 18 uh, in our partnerships with state and locals. So I, I feel very good about the election security strategy. In terms of the interagency on the federal network side, uh, we, we do have good buy-in uh, on our, our our protections at the edge of the gateway and Einstein system and others. Uh, we, we do need to continue to work on that. You know, talking with uh, the CISA team, their, their top three priorities are getting better at what they already do, federal networks, election security, and soft targets. Uh, and then, of course, working supply chain issues where we see components being brought into supply chains that could have vulnerabilities uh, and, and obviously industrial control systems. That, that's a huge challenge for cyber. It could have the biggest impact, everything from power to, to pipelines. So we're going to stay on top of it across those areas. Please do. Kevin, thanks for all your work on this. Thank you.